I'm sitting here with Mr. Bill Yance, who's kind enough to sit down with us and talk for a little while. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Bill, if you will, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Bill, and your, your life and kind of growing up here in Appalachia. Well, thank you very much. I love uh, your family back from your granddad and your dad and Wade and friends of my dad and things back when I was a kid. And uh, I grew up in Nanahala. Uh, they used to call it poor as a church house mouse. That's about the way we were. Right. You know, we made a living. No, we don't have nothing to complain about. And uh, then I grew up, and I dropped out of high school and finished high school, and I went to work. We moved to this area from Nanahala back in uh, uh, '51, I guess it was, and uh, we moved here in '51, and. Uh, I worked peach tree farm, home supply, and, and farm, which I love farming. I still love farming, and did that. And then I uh, went in the Air Force in uh, 1953, uh, February 1953, and uh, and again didn't have a high school education, but uh, uh, Air Force. One thing about them, they give you. Uh, chance, you know, and they sent me to the, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico after I got a, a basic training, and uh, they sent me three months to University of New Mexico in high school and finished my high school education on almost on time in 53. And uh, then uh, while we were waiting to go on those atomic bomb tests back then, uh, uh, we I I done everything from pool permit to KP. I mean I was never proud. I was just tickled to death to have a good job, you know. Right, right. I make eighty dollars a month or something like that. Right. You know. Right. And that was that was great to me. And then I was on the uh, first we went down to Weetok out in the South Pacific in the latter part of fifty three, after I got a break come home and it always just amazed me. Uh being able to do something like that, as I always said, a barefoot boy from Anahela, right. but I had a decent IQ, as they always said. And mm -hmm. something I learned about an IQ, a guy told me, uh, they did away with the IQ test, I think in 53, but they said, uh, uh, an IQ is not what you know or anything, it's your ability to learn. Right. And that, like an empty uh, and you being a school teacher, you know that. Yes, sir. And then, uh, uh, I learned that, that meant something to me, and I went in the Air Force. If you had an IQ of 110 or above, uh, you were qualified for cadets or which to go to flying school. And I had registered a year early, and I went ahead and and took you. You didn't have to go if you had an IQ of 110 or above. Surprisingly enough, I had an IQ of 128. Yeah. I know you know more about that That's pretty than sharp. I do. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but uh, and uh, without not mentioning the guy about being, that's what he told me, uh, that don't mean what you know, it means your ability to learn. Right. And that was a long time ago. Uh, but uh, I went ahead and applied for cadets, and then they found out how old I was, and I'd rested here early, and, and, but I still went done, done fine. Went back and and that and uh, then uh, uh, we went on those atomic bomb tests. I saw uh, all the atomic bomb tests at the end of wow. we talk. We were out there on a uh, island that was uh, three quarters mile wide and three miles wide. And we had straightened up the lender B 52s back then, and I saw all atomic bomb tests, 18 of them at that wow. time. I don't think that. Out of my secret clearance, tell I had top secret clearance in yeah. the Air Force. Yeah, I guess so. And there's not many people go there. <laughs> right. And, uh, I, and uh, <clears throat> we, uh, uh, then we come back to Albuquerque. I was in the 4931st Test Support Group in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which, as you probably know, being a school teacher, that's the Special Weapons Centers of the World. Mm -hmm. And I was signed there for five years. And then we come back to Albuquerque and stayed there about five or six months. And then we went to Nevada, the desert out there. I always said they thought I was a desert rat, you know. <laughs> we went out there and uh, did uh, 17, and they signed the non-proliferation treaty back then. 
and we didn't finish up and as on the first atomic bomb test was in Wetok and uh, I was I remember we were laying on uh, iron like railroad track and that bomb went off it was like daylight coming up at four o'clock in the morning sure. about five times straight and I jumped up and I got an over it was my fault and I jumped up and I started knocking me down yeah. But I still got an overdose of radioactivity and they sent wow. me back to Hawaii. But I mean, that's one time. Then uh, we come back and stayed in Albuquerque for four or five months and then we went to uh, 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 Yucca Flats and uh, and went uh, out there. And uh, I got my eyes burning on that. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've tried to get through my military record, but they have no record of me being in. Those, of course, I understand that. Mm -hmm. And they said if I could find one guy that would say that you would he die. knew me, <laughs> but there's nobody left. I'm yeah. 83 years old, right. and they don't nobody else left on those. Right. Days. <laughs> That'd be hard to do, hard to track down, for sure. <laughs> but you know, I told this guy in Franklin uh, that, and he said I don't believe that. He got on a computer right there, and so, and he said there's no record. If you're just being signed to the 4931st test for out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, they don't have no record of you being on yeah. those tests. And I right, said, you didn't dream it. <laughs> no, but I understand too. Sure, sure. You know, back then, uh, like they talked about giving the top one test out, you know, it was it was top. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, top uh, secret. I remember we used to have to stay in California six weeks before we got cleared. To get, I had a, see, I, my brother just got out of the army at that time, and uh, he looked, read my records, he read records, he said, it says you have a secret clearance in pending top. He said, what in the world would you do? And <laughs> I said, ask the Air Force. Yeah. That's all you, you didn't tell anything, That's right. you know. That made and he'd curious, been out, and I said, just ask the Air Force, you know. Right. But I mean, things like that, you just didn't tell. Right. You knew better. That's a long way from Nantahala, all those places in Mexico University. And you, you mentioned you graduated from Maryland University also. And uh, one thing I failed to mention when I introduced you that as far as my life, I've known you as really the most prominent uh, disc jockey or radio announcer in kind of our whole tri-county area here, you know, of Western North Carolina and North Georgia. Uh, you're kind of legendary as a as a disc jockey. Um, so you want to tell us a little bit about how you got to got involved with radio and, and maybe your early experiences with broadcasting and radio. Well, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, the guy's name was Boyd Whitney, and he was from uh, uh, and by my mind, good. He used to be uh, Beaumont, Texas, and uh, he uh, was from Beaumont, Texas in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was in the Air Force, but I always had a part-time job. I had to have that to make a living. I had, I was making allotment out. I think I drew $68 a month, or, and I had an allotment made down to my mom and daddy for 60, and mm -hmm. I made my own. I just left and you. I worked part-time. Yeah, I didn't leave you and, much. And I know you come up the same way, basically. Right. You know, and your daddy, Ray and I, and Jerry and I were friends all of our lives. Mm -hmm. Not our later life. Anyway, uh, but Boyd Whitney, and I was working at Katy, you know, uh, on this side of the Mississippi River, it's uh, like WKRK. On the other side of the Mississippi, it's KDEF, Katy. And, and Albuquerque, New Mexico is KDEF. And radio TV, I was work, but I was just a, a record for uh, DJs come in. But I was always interested in radio and said as a kid, as I said, that I was going to be a disc jockey. Right. Now, I don't know if I believe that or not, right. but I, be, I made it, uh, said not much of one. I never was much. Yeah. I said I was going to be a pilot. I wasn't ever much a pilot, but right. I, I made it. Right. Right. Uh, Both close. to the United States Air Force. But while I was in there for and I was working at KDEF Radio TV as a record, filing record. And Boyd Whitney come there and bought an hour out of Beaumont, Texas. And uh, he was a big time radio announcer back then. And uh, bought an hour a day. He bought his 15 minutes, never forget it. And I'd like to talk with him. And, mm -hmm. and he said, I'm gonna build my own radio station here in Albuquerque. 
and he was like me, he liked to talk a lot, and I was free to, you know, I just took, well, I, I liked the man, he liked me, he just stuck to me, and I was just about 21, 20, I don't know, 21, 22 years old, and, uh, and Boyd uh, said, uh, uh, I'm going to make a radio announcer out of you, I'm going to build my own radio scene, I've got the equipment in Tennessee, and I'm going to do this, you know, and you think like that you take for granted sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you appreciate a guy, and he did the same thing, and I went to work for him, and uh, and got started off, got brief in that, and radio, just hypothetical, not enough radio to uh, where you get a job anywhere. But I went overseas, and they had opened this uh, in Bentwaters, England, and they just opened this closed base circuit for two bases there, and I had a little. I was I was an administrator. That's what I was in. And I worked in my AFF, uh, every in, had to, uh, did your paperwork, right. obviously, yeah. And uh, and uh, and uh, we uh, and Boyd just one day said, uh, Amos Couch was a guy I never will forget. He made music the, and did the twelve to one uh, show, and he said, Bill, I'm Boyd said Amos not going to show up today. He he made music at night. He something happened, and he said, "I'm gonna let you, and I'll watch you." And I said, "Now, boy, I I I've watched you, and I I've never been on a control board in my life." Right. And I looked around. He was gone. All the he left me there. And knobs That's and... the way they know how to teach you, you know. Yeah. And he come back. He went to lunch ago. I did that ever since. Ever since then, it's kind of history. Just I sink just or went, swim. I history. just went. Uh, while I was in the Air Force, I worked in Corvallis, uh, Oregon, and I uh, worked in, in, uh, in, like I said, Corvallis, Oregon, and uh, in Albuquerque, and then I went over there and they started that station, and I got started. I had a different job. We handled the funds for the clubs and things like that, but we got, and Bill Fowler, uh, he stayed in the Air Force 12 years. And he started as a young airman. I was a sergeant, I guess, then. He said, you started my first break. He, uh, later years, uh, 20, 30 years ago, he said, his wife asked him, said, uh, uh, who do you remember in all the time in your life? He's a millionaire now. So, oh, uh, Bill, if you're listening, we're sending me some money. He sends me $20. I gave him $20 one time. And he didn't have a, and he sends me twenty dollars my birthday oh, every year. That's neat. Now you take a guy in sixty, fifty some years mm -hmm. to remember things like that. Yeah. And uh, he said that I give him his break in the radio. Yeah. And I don't remember it, but he worked for me in my regular job, taking care of the funds for the clubs and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, if I get too boring with my and talk care, you can get out anything you want to. But and. But uh, he still, we're still good friends, mm -hmm. fifty some years later, and things like that. And then I went Armed Forces Radio. And then I came back here, and uh, my last year, I was secretary to General Leahy, who was military advisor to Prince Sultan, and uh, commander of USMEDA, United States Military Training Mission to Saudi Arabia. But again, my AFSC, Air Force, was, was uh, administration. Yeah, but I went over there, and we had uh, four guys in there—a a, a colonel at that time, and a general, and a sonographer, and the Air Force, uh, or uh, uh, a regular administrative guy, to Sony and Art Brown. I'll never forget them. I mean, mm -hmm. forgot them. And uh, then when to Sony left, he was a sonographer, and I stayed, and I was secretary and uh, a board colonel, Colonel Miller, out of the Pentagon, and we were signed to the Pentagon. I had to go to the Pentagon, and I got paid out of the Pentagon, and they got paid out of the Pentagon in mm -hmm. Washington. But we were in New Smithham headquarters in Saudi Arabia, but we had 11 Air Force bases there that it big enough to have a high of their own high school yeah. in Saudi Arabia. Wow. wow. And, uh, and we, uh, 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 through uh, that, you know, and... Uh, then to Sony left, and they sent two different guys from Washington. And the old man, we had a general then, he's an army general, and General Leahy, and Colonel Miller was the chief of staff, 
and I was a little peon, a sergeant, <laughs> you know. But three of us were in that one office. Mm -hmm. It was a big organization. But uh, that was my last year in the Air Force. Sure. And anything you want to ask me? Well, that. I appreciate it, Bill, because obviously I didn't know about any of that, that background. And, and it makes sense, you know, to think about you being on all those different stations. Of course, my whole life I've known of you as being the voice of WKRK. I was there 50 years, like 50 three months. Years. And, uh, you know, uh, I think you were so popular on that program, one for your voice, you just have a great on-air voice. And then more than that, I feel like, you know, your personality and, and running uh, uh, party, party line and things like that over the years. I, I know that a number of times um, folks, uh, outsiders might call in on the air and they might not be the most polite <laughs> folks. And, and you had a, an uncanny way of kind of uh, putting them in their place if they, uh, if they were trying to be short, you know. Uh, we had uh, regulars down through the years who would call in a lot, like is it Mrs. Franny or Miss Fanny, that is kind of a staple, and she might call on there and she might talk for a while about what's growing in her garden or Anything this or that. Or <laughs> and the local people, you know, that's local color, they enjoy it, but then you might have somebody from, uh, from a bigger, more metropolitan background, and they might call in and complain. I can remember a gentleman called in one, one time, I don't, you probably won't remember this, having fielded so many calls, but he was uh, being critical of things like that and talking about how everything should be run around here. But he was mispronouncing Cherokee County. He was actually saying Cherokee. Cherokee. <laughs> and after a while you said, well, you know, if you're such an expert on this place, you'd think by now you'd know how to pronounce the name of the county that we're in. <laughs> Thank you very much for calling Party Line. <laughs> and you know, I remember, I remember telling that story I was coming out, I think, when McDonald's come here years ago, and these people were coming through here, and we talked about that a lot on the radio, but uh, they were coming outside, and they asked me as I was coming out, was I from here? And one of those other guys said, he's on the radio, he knows all, you know, yeah. just that kind of, just general conversation. And he said, we're wanting to go up to Cherokee. <laughs> and uh, we were standing outside. Until he said, we want to go up to Cherokee. And I said, you mean Cherokee? I said, that's an Indian name, you know. Yeah. I said, uh, you know, I, and we, told, we talked about it on the radio a lot. And people enjoyed, you know. Oh, yeah. But uh, really, when you look at the word, and I thought about it a lot, and I'm, I just love pronunciation words and being in my business, there are things I have yeah, for some years. Cherokee it sounds more than Cherokee. Yeah. Does. Kind of I exotic. mean really. Yeah. I mean uh, Well I mispronounce a lot of things but, but oh, you know, I do it was, too. I you wouldn't have called that, that guy on that. It, it was his attitude was, was out of line. Um, and you mentioned my dad and my uncle. I, of course both my uncles, uh, Jerry, Ray and Henry the Wilson brothers, they made music They were for two of my best friends in the world. Probably 45 years thereabouts, gospel music, and I know you spun their records a lot, and we appreciate that. And you actually gave uh, Dad and Ray my favorite compliment of all time uh, on the air one time. You said they didn't have enough ambition to get out of a mud hole. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was my uh, favorite compliment because in a roundabout, you, you were saying these guys are talented, and they ought to go somewhere. They ought to do something, you know. But uh, they just stayed around here and worked a job and uh, raised a family and things like that. And that's nothing wrong with that. But that was my favorite compliment that they ever received. You know, that first album that they caught, and if you've got one, I've got one. No, my house burned, I think, burned. I wrote first album that Jerry and Ray recorded. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother was a good musician. I made music and had a band for 60 years. But I was never a good musician. But well. I mean, I got by for six years. Uh, Carl Green said one time, said, Bill, uh, you don't play a mandolin. You just use two feet. And I said, Carl, I got by with it for 60 years playing the band <laughs> and running the band. You know, yeah. you, uh, I don't do it like everybody else does. I played music all the lot. But I played mandolin and guitar. I, my brother gave me my first mandolin and I was 12 years old. He wanted me to learn the chords on the guitar and things and I've told many people 
what they say, what would you do? I said, learn to play a guitar for at least a chord. And then yeah. if banjo, whatever you're going to that's go good into. Advice, yeah. Now you've been a left professional here, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's a good foundation, the guitar. Exactly. And then go from there to other you know what chords you're in and what chords right. and things like that. It, it, it's just that's good advice. Yeah. It's uh, uh, just think that Jerry and Ray well, and I were just friends all over. All, well, after I come back from the Air Force and Jerry and Ray and Wade, uh, your daddy, granddaddy, and my daddy was the best friends in the world. And uh, things like that it just mean so much to me. Well, and us too. then you and Eric winding up friends mm -hmm. and like playing tennis. Just so everybody has an interest in life, but you and Eric not interested in uh, not tied uh, by like music, play, yeah, uh, different connection, connection, yeah, the way tennis. people are, and uh, that's always amazing to me, you know, how people in life and the way I've been in life and the things that I started off in Nanahala, I would never have believed that mm -hmm. I'd have wound up my 12th year in the Air Force as secretary to the general Lee, military right. advisor to Prince Sultan. I would have never dreamed of right. that. I would have dreamed of being a pilot and I made no, Lord, not the best in the world. I mm -hmm. I got by I'd be a discharge. I wasn't no good at discharge either. Oh no, but I'm not familiar with your piloting, but I am familiar with your, your But I mean discharge. I, I started off Bro. like I say, a guy put me on there and not even know what was going on, right. uh, just sitting and watching him. Well, and I took off and did an hour program. Yeah. And that was been 60 years ago. It may I have mean, been meant to be, Bill. But it yeah. was my want to be. Right. Well, you uh, growing up as you did, and probably not poor like I was, I hope not, uh, but not the richest people in the world. Right. Uh, but did you ever think about becoming principal? No, I mean seriously, <laughs> no, I, like me, did I ever think about, did you ever really think about I never even thought I would be a, a teacher. Uh, really? Much, right, much less a principal, but it, like you were saying, it's funny how life can, can work out for you and maybe uh, what you want to do or what you're planning to do, you might wind up doing something different, but it might be a better situation for you. Um, I've been really blessed, you know, blessed by my family, my friends, good friends like Eric. Um, and just the way the Lord had everything work out for me, I, you know, I'm, I'm really blessed and really fortunate. Well, uh, like uh, people ask me, and I've said, uh, uh, I, I can't believe that me being a barefoot boy on Nanahala, mm -hmm. poor, the, I mean, you don't get no more. We, we made a good nine kids, mm -hmm. and my daddy is a sawmill worker. Right. I mean, well, your granddaddy was too, because he worked oh, yeah. with my daddy, and uh, and but my daddy was well educated back in his day. He uh, spent uh, he got out of the he was in he sailed in Belgium, France, Germany, wow. World War One, all that, and and you got commission to become something you don't ever dream of becoming, right, and. I, I never anticipated doing that myself, uh, but uh, I always liked the Air Force and mm -hmm. and wanted to go in there. And and the breaks, any a kid today uh, that would wants to go in the military, Army, Air Force, Air Force was mine. Uh, when I, I remember my brother uh, coming out of the Army, and he said, "Bill, you didn't finish high school. I don't think you can get in the Air Force." And he went down there and said, let me go down there and talk to the recruiter with you. And we talked to him. He said, let me give him a little 25 minute, 25 question test or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he, they talked Army and Air Force and talked. And he came out and he said, if he'll do as good on this as he go to Charlotte, he said, I'll get him in the Air Force mm -hmm. before he gets drafted. I was, uh, and uh, I mean, that pleased me. I, and, and Gene said, you, you know my brother, he didn't ever think I had much <laughs> <laughs> He's selling you short. He wasn't giving you credit. Uh, uh, no, he, he apologized later. He said, I yeah. always do, but you were always so confident I didn't want to. Yeah. You know? yeah. and, uh, and 
and that recruiter, in two weeks they had me and Charlotte taking the test. Yeah. And I was on my way in the Air Force, you know, yeah. short like. Uh, but I mean, uh, look back on life, uh, and my hard life at Nantahala, I've, the Yonce has literally settled Nantahala, and mm. not many, but I mean, we just uh, always ambition. My daddy went to school, and he got out of the Air Force, uh, got out of the Army at 28 years old. And Mama had just finished teacher's college in Franklin. Back then, they started teaching at 15 years old. If you took a test, Miss Dean, my, uh, 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 she taught every one of us in high school, and she got her, I ruled, she died at 103, that she got her a master's degree at 54 years old. Wow. But no, back in 1954. She oh, was older than okay. that. In 1954, yeah. she taught school probably 30 some years yeah. then. But all ladies, that ambition, like right. my mama right. uh, was teaching school at 17 years old. Sometimes you you go back to the old reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's what Miss Dean always said, that woman I was talking about. Read, if you know that, she said, Bill, you'll go anywhere you want to go. Mm -hmm. If you'll learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, you'll go anywhere you want to go. That foundation. But if you put all of it, basically goes right back to the same thing. Mm -hmm.